So I want to start this video by thanking the patrons and subscribers and of this channel, those who have donated to the work I do, because today's collection of short, very short letters of St. Francis de Sales come by way of a very, a very well tattered book that I have. That is a collection of his letters. It's pretty old. I'd show a picture, but again, it's pretty haggard looking. But it was through their donations that I was able to pick this up, and so. I'm going to bring you those letters over the course of the next few months. Some of them are very, very short, so you get probably four here in the next ten minutes. So I hope you find it helpful. St. Francis de Sales' writing is very straightforward, and his message is rather simple. Trust in the Lord in all seasons of life. As we near the end of the Easter season, I thought that that would be an appropriate message to bring as we get ready for Pentecost. Seasons of Life by St. Francis de Sales. All of the seasons of life come together in the soul. Sometimes we feel winter sterility, distraction, distaste, and boredom. Sometimes springs do, with the fragrance of holy blossoms, and sometimes a burning desire to please our good God. What remains is autumn, and even then we may see no great harvest. Yet it often happens that in threshing the wheat and pressing the grape, we find a greater yield than we had expected. We want it always to be spring and summer, but there must be vicissitudes of the interior life as well as the exterior. Only in heaven will everything be springtime in its beauty, autumn in its fruitfulness, and summer in its ardor. There will be no winter there, but here winter is necessary for the work of abnegation and for the thousand minor but beautiful virtues that we exercise in a fallow time. Let us then continue to put one foot in front of the other. Provided our hearts be true, we will walk aright. Jesus the Gardener Don't be anxious. Rouse yourself to serve the Lord with steadfastness, attentiveness, and meekness. That is the true way to serve him. If you can refrain from trying to do all the things, but instead attempt to do only some one thing, then you will do much. Practice the mortifications that most often present themselves to you, for that is the first duty to be done. After that you can take up the others. Lovingly kiss the crosses that our Lord himself lays upon your arms, without looking to see whether they are of precious or aromatic wood. They are more truly crosses than they are made of wood that smells dirty and is considered useless. Mary Magdalene tried to hold on to our Lord. She wanted him for himself. His appearance was not as she had wished it to be, which is why she looked at him without recognizing him. She wanted to see him arrayed in glory, not in the common clothes of a gardener. Yet in the end she knew that it was he when he said to her, Mary. See John chapter 20, verses 14 to 16. You see, it is our Lord, garbed as a gardener, whom we meet day by day, here and there, in the ordinary mortifications that present themselves to us. We want more noble-seeming ones, but the ones that seem the most noble are not the best. Before we see him in his glory, he wants to plant many humble flowers in our garden, according to his plan. That is why he is dressed the way he is. Our task is to let our hearts be ever united to his, and our wills to his pleasure. Let us make our way through the low valleys of the humble little virtues. There we will see roses among thorns, charity shining forth amid interior and exterior affliction, lilies of purity and violets of mortification. We ought to love above all others these three small virtues, meekness of heart, poverty of spirit, and simplicity of life, together with those common labors of visiting the sick, serving the poor, and consoling the afflicted. Yet let it all be done freely and without anxiety. No, our arms are not strong enough for us to climb the cedars of Lebanon. Let us be content with the hyssop that grows in the valleys. Be very meek. You should live not according to your passions and your inclinations, but according to the reason and devotion. Love tenderly those who have been given to you by the hand of our Lord. Be very humble toward all. Direct your mind toward peace and tranquility and suffocate your bad inclinations by attending diligently to the practice of contrary virtues. Mark well these words. You are suffering because you fear vice more than you love virtue. 
If you were able to stir your heart a little more deeply to the practice of meekness and true humility, you would be courageous, but you must frequently think of it. Prepare yourself to do so first thing each morning, and God will send you a thousand consolations. And do not forget to lift your heart to God in your thoughts to eternity. A pattern of Devotion Here in short compass are the exercises that I recommend. First, when you arise, briefly prepare yourself for the whole day. Then your mental prayer should be before the noon meal, when you are not otherwise unoccupied and for about an hour at a time. Retreat briefly in the evening before supper, and by way of repetition, make a dozen lively aspirations to God in accord with your morning's meditation or on some other subject. During the day and between its tasks, as often as you can, you should examine yourself to see whether your affections have been distracted by some other object, and whether you are still holding our Lord by the hand. Should you find yourself at a loss, gather your soul together and set it at rest. Imagine yourself like Our Lady, calmly working with one hand while holding onto Our Lord with the other, or holding him with her other arm during his infancy. In times of peace and tranquility, multiply your acts of humility, for by this means you will be accustomed in your heart to meekness. Do not attempt to com combat by argument the little temptations that arise. Instead, simply bring your heart back to Jesus Christ crucified. Do not trouble yourself to make many vocal prayers. And always, when you pray and you, you sense your heart carried to mental prayer, let it go there straight away. And should your mental prayer be accompanied by only the Lord's Prayer, the angelic salutation and the creed, you may be content. How happy you will be if, while you are in the world, you keep Jesus in your heart. Remember the principal lesson he left to us, and in only a few short words, so that we would be able to remember it. Learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. See Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. It is everything to have a heart that is meek toward our neighbor and humble toward God. At every moment, give such a heart to our Savior, and let it be the heart of your heart. You will see that to the extent that this holy and con considerate friend takes up a place in your mind, the world with its vanities and trifles will leave you. Peace of soul and humility. Nothing troubles us so much as self-love and self-regard. Should our hearts not grow soft with the sentiment we desire when we pray, and with the interior sweetness we expect when we meditate, we are sorrowful. Should we find some difficulty in doing good deeds, should some obstacle oppose our plans, we are in a dither to overcome it, and we labor anxiously. Why is this? Doubtless because we love our consolations, ease and comfort. We want to pray as though we were bathing in comfort, to be virtuous as though we were eating dessert, all the while failing to look upon our sweet Jesus, who, prostrate on the ground, sweat blood and water from the distress of the extreme interior combat he underwent. See Mark chapter 14, verse 35, and Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Self-love is one of the sources of our anxiety. The other is our high regard for ourselves. Why are we troubled to find that we have committed a sin or even an imperfection? Because we thought ourselves to be something good, firm, and solid. And therefore, when we have seen the proof to the contrary, and have fallen on our faces in the dirt, we are troubled, offended, and anxious. If we understood ourselves, we would be astonished that we are ever able to remain standing. This is the other source of our anxiety. We want only consolations, and we are surprised to encounter our own misery, nothingness, and folly. There are three things we must do to be at peace. Have a pure intention to desire the honor and glory of God in all things. Do the little that we can unto that end, following the advice of our spiritual Father, and leave all the rest to God's care. Why should we torment ourselves if God is our aim, and what we have done all that we can? Why be anxious? What is there to fear? God is not so terrible to those who love him. He contents himself with little, for he knows how little we have. Our Lord is called the Prince of Peace in the Scriptures. See Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And because he is the absolute master, he holds all things in peace. It is nevertheless true that before bringing peace to a place, he first brings war. See Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. By dividing the heart and soul from its most dear, familiar, and ordinary affections. Now, when our Lord separates us from these passions, it seems that he burns our hearts alive, and we are embittered. The separation is so painful that it is barely possible for us to avoid fighting against it with all our soul. Peace is not lacking in the end when, although burdened by this distress, we keep our will resigned to our Lord. 
keep it nailed to God's good pleasure, and fulfill our duties courageously. We may take, for example, our Lord's agony in the garden, where, overwhelmed by interior and exterior bitterness, he nonetheless resigned himself peaceably to his Father's divine will, saying, Not my will, but thine be done. See Luke chapter 22, verse 42. And he maintained this peace when admonished three times the disciples who failed him. See Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 to 45. At war with sin and suffering bitterly, he remained the Prince of Peace. We can draw the following lessons from this consideration. The first is that we often mistakenly think that we have lost our peace when we are bitter. If we continue to deny ourselves and desire that everything should be done in accord with God's good pleasure, and if we fulfill our duties in spite of our bitterness, then we preserve our peace. The second is that when we are suffering interiorly, that God rips off the last bits of skin of the old man in order to renew us in the new man that is made according to God. See Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. And so we should never be disturbed by such sufferings or think that we are disgraced in our Lord's eyes. The third is that all the thoughts that give us anxious and restless minds are not from God, who is the Prince of Peace. They are, therefore, temptations from the enemy, and we must reject them. We must in all things remain at peace. Should interior or exterior pains afflict us, we must accept them peacefully. Should joys come our ways, they must be received peacefully, without transport. If we must flee evil, we must do so calmly, without being disturbed. Otherwise, we may fall in our flight and give the enemy the chance to slay us. If there is good to be done, it must be done peacefully, or we will commit many faults through haste. Even penance must be done peacefully. See, says the penitent, that my great bitterness is in peace. See Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17. As to humility, this virtue sees to it that we are neither troubled by our imperfections, nor in the habit of recalling those of others. For why should we be more perfect than our brothers? Why should we find it strange that others have imperfections since we ourselves have so many? Humility gives us a soft heart for the perfect and the imperfect, for the former out of reverence and for the latter out of compassion. Humility makes us accept pains with meekness, knowing that we deserve them, and good things with gratitude, knowing that we do not. Every day we ought to make some act of humility, or speak heartfelt words of humility, words that lower us to the level of a servant, and words that serve others, however modestly, either in our homes or in the world. I hope you found that helpful for this Sunday. Thanks again to the patrons and members of this channel who have made the purchase of these old tattered books that are whose copyright is definitely expired well worth uh, definitely well worth it. So this was brought to you by the patrons of the channel. Anyway, you have a blessed Sunday.